Welcome. Now, another company. 25 marker question, starting with the requirement A. Discuss the acceptability of a company's decision not to record any liabilities for the roof collapse, which means the company is being sued, perhaps, in the consolidated financial statement. So, we are given seven marks here. If any student is talking about the impairment of non-current asset, according to IS number 36, there will be no marks for that, because the question specifically asks you that because of the roof collapse and somebody is suing the company, and whether or not we should record any liabilities. And of course, from the case that the management decides not to record any liabilities at all, so this is not acceptable, perhaps, but this may be acceptable if this is on the early stage okay, of the case. Uh, so according to the IAS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent asset, so we need to apply the correct accounting treatment on that. Of course, I would detail that in three steps. The IFRS requirements, application to the case, and making your own conclusion about the right accounting entry, or the impact on the financial statements, or the conceptual framework requirement. So make sure that seven marks, seven sentences. Part B. Discuss the acceptability of a company's decision in the consolidated financial statements number one to disclose a contingent liability for the estimated cost of redeeming the put options. Right, so what do I mean by put options? Don't be scared if you see this term. It's relatively straightforward. It's just to be an option to sell something at a particular price. It's what I mean by put option, but in the case later on, we'll see that the company has written the put option, which means has sold the put option to others. So this means that if the buyer exercises the put option at some point in the future, from the company's point of view, it will have an obligation to exercise it. Okay, so it seems to me it's like the financial liability that we, really, we need to recognise. And yes, IAS number 32, the financial instrument accounting standards knowledge pops up into my mind. Okay, so making sure about the presentation part, we make this right. Number two, to record the non redeemable preference shares as equity rather than a compound financial instrument. Okay, so we are given six marks here. Again, these two requirements are related to ICE number 32 to recognise the compound financial instrument. We need to see that whether or not a contract contains both of the liability and the equity element in, and we'll see that later on. Of course, yes, we are given six marks here. Any requirements that is more than five marks, make sure that you follow the three steps very carefully. The three steps includes the general IFRS quotes with the detailed requirements in there, an application to the case, which I'll show you how in a second, and finally the conclusion part. My advice to be to focus on these three stuff, the advice to accompany about the correct accounting treatment and the impact on the financial statement particularly for ratios, something like that. Alternatively, the marking team and the examining team of the SBR said that the conceptual framework requirements can always be quoted in your answer and you will get reasonable marks by doing so. So make sure that you follow these three steps here. Now, as the final requirement is that, yes, okay, wow, IAS number 7 statement of cash flows tested here. Now we are given A marks for this 1, 2, 3 requirement. So make sure that in the CBE exam, I'll show you how in a second. First is to copy all these requirements in the word processor and make sure you use them as headings and write eight sentences 
okay, in total. Now, number one is to explain the importance and the distinction between classification of cash flows from investing and financing activities. So make sure that if I were you, I would like to use investing activities and financing activities as my subheadings. And within each of the subheading, I will need to tell the examiner, firstly, what will be the importance of showing cash flows in both of these headings. At the same time, the differences in that. Okay. So making sure that you write enough sentences. So if I were you, I would like to approximately allocate three marks at least to the part one. Number two is to outline the circumstances where the cash flows may be reported on a net basis. Well, if you know about the accounting standards, I must say that the number two requirement, you can write approximately five sentences in there. But I'm sure that a lot of students are not quite familiar with a net basis here. So if I were you, is that, right, I would like to say about two possible points, okay, related to number two, because I know that net basis is that firstly, yeah, there, there, there are two easy marks that I can get there. So firstly, the cash flows from operations, okay, especially for the net cash flows from operations, yes, will be shown on the phase of the statement of cash flow on a one-line basis by netting all these cash flows in. Alternatively, the cash flows may be net, for example, how about for cash and cash equivalents, yeah, so these sort of things will be net off against each other, especially for the positive cash in the current asset and overdraft in the current liabilities. So I must say that, for example, for bank, I'll show you my answer later on. We'll get another scenario in. But I must say I'm not so clever in this particular requirement. Yes, you, will, yes, you can allocate two marks in that. So three marks for the first part, two marks for the second part. The remaining, yes, three marks for the application because we are required to discuss the issues with the company's treatment of cash flows for the year ended. We need to make our comment where not the exam team, yeah, in this scenario, has treated the case in a correct manner. I will see that later on. So don't be so clever, again, okay, in the part two especially. Uh, don't be put off if you see such requirements in the actual exam. Now, let's read through the background of the case. You see, uh, Fernanda Company is the parent company of a group uh, which constructs industrial properties. Right, okay. Now, uh, Fernanda Company is currently preparing the consultation financial statement with the exhibit, okay, for the number one, the roof collapse, the financial instrument in number two, and the cash flows issues in number three. Let's read through the exhibit number one firstly and to deal with the part A. Now we're told Fernanda Company is a group construct industrial properties and in September 20X7, now the current year end will be 31st December. Again, the event is before the year end, so we are not expected to talk about any sort of IAS number 10 event after the reporting period because these sort of events happened before the current financial statement here event. And we are told a section of the roof of one of the buildings which it had constructed partially collapsed. Alright, so you may think of any impairment of non-current asset but this is not required in a part A. However here it injured 10 people there. So this means that it pops into my mindset that the company's being sued. Production, which was taking place inside the building, had to be stopped. Right. Now, if you ask about any sort of borrowing costs according to IAS number 23, the interest, if I were to take a loan and to support my production, 
yes, the interest related to it, I must say that because the production has been stopped, and the interest, yes, highly likely that we need to stop capitalising it, according to ICE number 23. However, we're not asked about that. If you're throwing your knowledge, okay, dumping the knowledge into the question, you'll get no marks at all. Moving on, however, no legal action has been brought against the company at the year end. Right, so because no legal action here, I would say that there'll be no present obligation at all. It seems that no one is suing us. Okay. Um, as the accident investigators were still trying to find out the reason for the collapse. All right. Now, the accident investigators will be very, very important here because to determine the probability that we need to pay cash or we need to um, compensate for the losses of those 10 people. So, uh, because it's at the early stage of the case, they're still investigating it. So this means that I would say that the probability is not probable, okay, that we need to compensate for those 10 people. So if that's the case, I would say that no is like no uh, provision liability. Now, the investigators were assessing the responsibilities of various parties involved. So this means that it may not be our fault, but they're not particularly sure. With the report expected in February 20x8. All right. Now, uh, because this event, yes, took place before the current year of end, and we will get the report two months later, uh, it, it seems to me that in two months later, which means next year, so we may be adjusting it as the adjusting event. However, at the current financial statement year of end, I would say that no, it's like, it's like not a probable catch out flow. The extent of the damage and details of any compensation payments to be made has not yet been determined. Right, so this means that the expenses cannot be reliably estimated. All right. Now, we're not sure whether or not it's our fault, but I would say that it's highly likely that it's our fault. Okay, so I, I would say although there will be no legal obligation right now because no one is suing us, but I would say that according to the prudent reason, uh, I would disclose as a contingent liability there. Now, finally, uh, the company failed that given the current stage of the investigation into the accident, there's no requirements to record any sort of liability in a council data account. I would say that yes, I will support your claim in this time, uh, especially as the company failed that any compensation payable will be covered by the insurance. I would say that because we're not particularly sure about any sort of expenses that we need to pay for because firstly, it's at the early stage. Secondly, we're not sure how much reimbursements that we can claim from the insurance company. So this means that expenses cannot be reliably estimated. So, of course, yes, no need to provide for provision liability. Because, for example, according to the IAS number 37, I would say that, yes, this is the provision accounting. They can write them in for provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent asset. We need to fulfil the POR criteria to recognise the provision liability. Firstly, is the probable cash outflow, which means more than 50% of chance we to make the compensation. Secondly, is the present obligation either arising from the laws and regulation, or you have set that before, which means constructive obligation. Finally, there should be reliably estimating 
the amount that we need to pay for. Now, all these criteria are met we need to debit the expense and to credit the provision liability. Alternatively, regarding the contingent liability, on the other hand, if it is only possible, cash outflow, which means not more than 50% chance here, I would say that yes, it's like possible cash outflow in this case. You will also say that, well, it seems that you have no obligation at all. You haven't set up because it's not a constructive obligation. It's not arising from the legal side because nobody is suing you. But I would deem that, yes, you will be sued, okay, uh, because it's highly likely that you, you have injured these 10 people. So bearing certain amount of responsibility according to the uh, practical experience, it's highly likely that this will be met. And, well, whether or not we can reliably estimate the numbers or the amounts that we need to pay for, but the answer is no. Firstly, it's at the early stage. Secondly, the amount reimbursed by the insurance company, we're not particularly sure. By the insurance company is questionable. And therefore, yes, uh, we meet with the contingency liability criteria here, and we disclose the contingency liability with the uh, detailed disclosure about the nature of the event, possible outflows, and we are not really estimating the amounts that we need to pay for reliably. Now, let me show you my answers. This requirement only gives you seven marks. If I were you, I'd like to certainly write sentences in this paper, okay, to get these marks. Now, because it's more than five marks, the step number one will always be the quote from the I files. But you don't really have to tell the examiner about the IAS number 37. You don't really have to quote the numbers. You can still get the full marks. You don't really have to quote the exact, correct accounting standards name. But if I were you, I'd like to simply say, per the IFRS, provision accounting. Now, a provision liability is recognised if P O R criteria, okay, are met. Now, moving on to the second step there, you may say, well, Steve, it's like quoting the IFRS. You simply quote the IFRS related to provisions. Can I quote the IFRS requirements related to contingency liability? Yes, certainly you can. But can I quote the IFRS related to impairment of asset? Because I think that because the roof has been collapsed and Therefore, yes, the asset is being impaired. Why not stop production, stop capitalising the interest expense if the company takes out a loan for that? No, no need to do that. There's no marks for those irrelevant points because they are not asked by the examining team. For the application then, firstly, I would say in this year, the damages have not been determined, which means that it's not probable couch outflows, no present obligations, okay, because no one's suing you, and also investigating various parties' responsibilities by the investigators, and the expenses cannot be reliably measured, uh, estimated, because it's at the early stage. At the same time, we're not sure how much insurance that we can claim from the company. So this means that moving on to the final step there, my conclusion, yes, according to practical experience, yes, disclose the contingent liability, including the nature, the early stage, okay, so meaning that the possibility is only possible and uncertainty is over payment to be received and making the uh, estimate of the payment to be, uh, cannot be made reliably. Now, pick up seven points in there, of course you will get the full marks related to part A. From my perspective, I think that's fair. Now, let's move on to number two. 
Number two, part one, is that the company has already disclosed a contingency liability to redeem the put option. Whether or not that's correct there, we need to see that. Exhibit number two, put options. That relates to part B, number one now. It said in this year, as a result of the business combination, okay, yeah, we, we combine with each other, buy another company. Our company has written, what do I mean by written? Yes, sold. Now, if a party, for example, party one, written, written into the contract, and sold the put option to the buyer, number two would be the buyer. Buyer buying the put option means that the buyer will have a choice where not to exercise it. If a buyer, which means the party two, if the party two decides to exercise it, party one has to exercise it. It creates the obligation to party one. It seems that's fair, it's like the liability. However, in this case, moving on, the company's written put options to purchase the NCI shareholding in a newly acquired subsidiary called Runda Company. Right, now, who are we? We are the F company, we bought the R company, but we haven't bought the entire R company shareholdings. So this means that I've obtained control for our company. However, the amount I haven't bought will be the non-controlling interest, or the NCI for short. This F company, okay, says to the R shareholders, says to the NCI, if you decide to sell your shares to me at some point in the future, feel free to do so. Right there, okay. It's like the rights to buy out all the R company shareholdings. Okay, I know that it's not from the, in the SBR syllabus knowledge, but it's the knowledge from the AFM, Advanced Financial Management. But all we're trying to say here is this. We can allow the NCI to sell the shareholdings at some point in the future to the F company. And this is why we're guaranteed through the put option contract there. And to the F company here, yes, the F company, which means our company, will have an obligation to exercise these contracts at some point in the future. So this means that our company will be obliged, okay, notice the word obliged, which means have to, no choice, which means a liability, to purchase the NCI shares in the subsidiary if a put options were exercised by the share NCI shareholders. All right, though. At the year end, our company disclosed a contingent liability in a consolidated financial statement for the estimated costs of redeeming the put options. Were it not that sensible? Well, looking back to the criteria for the contingent liability, possible cash outflows? Not sure whether or not it's possible. Um, obligation, is, the, is it a present obligation arising from the law? It seems to be yes, because if they were to exercise it, we'll have to pay for it. Can we estimate the amount of reliably? Hmm. The answer is yes, it's written into a contract uh, for the amounts that you can sell, okay? So to exercise the, the, the contract using your put option, it seems that, yeah, it, it needs to be three criteria here. Disclosing a contingent liability? I'd rather say no. No, in this case. The reason is, is we've written the put options. Now, the put options, because from this contract, it can be turned into cash directly. So it's more like the 
financial liability that we need to recognise rather than the contingent liability. Because it's like the contingent liability usually exists firstly, uh, for example, someone is being sued. Alternatively, that you are in breach of the relevant laws and regulations. Thirdly, commonly seen that it's more like a provision liability is that the company sells product at the same time providing the warranty service. Now, it's not one of those. So rather classify the transaction in the financial liability rather than saying that this is a contingent liability because it seems like it seems like meeting with these three criteria. No. The best practice would be to classify them as the financial liability. I'll show you my answer here because it's four marks question. So firstly, I will briefly introduce the financial instrument I advise. If you're not sure about that, please do say per I advise financial instrument. Of course, if you see the examiner's answer, that's according to the IAS number 32 about the presentation of the financial instrument. But if I were you, you don't really have to show the, you don't really have to quote the numbers in. The financial liability should be recognised if it is an obligation to you that you will need to transfer your cash to buy something. And in this case, you're buying your own shares, which means buying your own equity instrument. So if you've got an obligation, you will have to spend the money out if another party wishes, you will need to spend the money else to buy the things, buy your own shares. Yes, it will be a financial liability to you. Now, let's so apply that to the case. Is that it seems that the shares contract, namely the NCI put options. Okay, now, putting the words in, these are contract, including within there, inside there, we've got obligation to buy shares for cash. Okay, so this is why, yes, it's the financial liability, and make your own conclusion, we should recognise the financial liability, and to remove the disclosure of the contingent liability. Now, the conclusion here, I'm using the way number one to suggest the correct accounting entry. Now, if I were you, I would like to stop from there. Yes, getting three marks out of four, I must say that I've done a good job to pass this paper. But if you're super clever indeed, you can also say that how you should measure the financial liability. And of course, according to the IFRS number nine, to measure the financial liability, that should be at the fair value. And more specifically, in this particular case, is that the amount that you will redeem, you will need to discount them as the present value, because present value still is one of the examples of the fair value. So make sure that you're ready. Redeems or to redemption amount, which means the amount that you need to pay for, okay, pay for the NCI shareholders, discount them at present value, and that would be the financial liability value. Moving on then, okay, now, number two, okay, related to part B number two, it's all about the preference shares. Now, we're given six marks in this requirement to record the non-redeemable preference shares as equity rather than a compound financial instrument. Right. Now, firstly, it's non-redeemable, which means we are not paying back your investment at some point in the future. So, which means you buy my shares, but never think of that I will pay the money back to you, which means non-redeemable. It's a preference share, okay, so this means that it's not an ordinary share. It's highly unlikely that you can attend our AGM or annual journal meeting. So, uh, in most circumstances, the preference shares, if they are redeemable, yes, it's like a liability to a company. If it is non-redeemable, it's like the equity. However, at the SBR level here, we need to see the detailed requirement 
a coin set I is number 32. So this means that, okay, even though it's non-redeemable, we cannot simply say that this must be an equity instrument at this early stage. We'll need to see that the terms and conditions within the preference shares that whether or not we will pay a fixed amount of money to the buyer. So the fixed amount of money that could be the fixed amount of dividend or fixed, fixed amount of cash that relates to the share price of our company. So if either of these answers would be yes, of course, and that would be a liability okay, to the company. I will need to see that. Now let's read through the number two here for preference shares. So it says, in order to partly fund the purchase of subsidiary, all right, so it's like a, the company is performing the LBO, the leverage buyout. Again, yes, this is not in the SBR syllabus, but it's in the AFM syllabus later on. Uh, the company issued non-redeemable preference shares and recognised them as the equity instrument. Right. So this means that it increases the share capital or possibly the share premium. Now, the preference shareholders receive an annual fixed cash dividend of 5% now. Right. So we are paying the fixed amount, which means we have to pay to those preference shareholders. It's not the obligation to the company. And a participating dividend, 7% of the ordinary share dividend now. So this means that the 7% now is like variable. Okay? So we're not particularly sure from time to time how much that we need to pay to our preference shareholders. Right, so it seems like we've got a characteristic of both liability and also the equity instrument. We're issuing ordinary shares, something like that. We've got both. We are not having only one. So it seems to me that according to IS number 32 for the financial instruments presentation, it's highly likely that this will be the compound instruments that we need to recognise. And the company stated that the instrument had characteristics of equity capital because it provided for participation of future income of a company. So therefore, the company concluded that in compliance uh, with IS number 32 would be so misleading because it will conflict with the objective of financial statements set out in the conceptual framework. I would say that, yes, you're absolutely right there. You are quoting the requirements from the IAS number one, which means the presentation of financial statement about the departure of IFRS. So this means that if you think that following the IFRS would not result in uh, the faithful representation or improving the relevance of the transaction, just depart from it, okay? Just stick to your local gap, okay, to prepare for the account. It's absolutely fine there. But you cannot use that as an excuse that because I think the shares is like share. So this means that it's like share and put that into equity. You can't use the ICE number one presentation of FS for the departure of the IFRS as your excuse. Because according to the ICE number one presentation of financial statement, he said that in quite rarely extreme cases that we can apply this exception rule in our accounting treatment. And the company considers the classification of preference shares to be equity rather than a compound instrument. So if you were to correct that mistake, all you need to do is to move your equity element, splitting that into the financial liability and the reserve. So it's important that you recognise that fact because currently what business is done so currently, 
is that the business debiting cash onto credit highly likely in the share capital and also credit the share premium account similar to the ordinary shares. However, if I were to correct that mistake, I will need to reallocate the share capital and premium into firstly the financial liability, usually in the non-current liability section, and the reserve, okay, it's like the capital reserve in our statement of financial position. So after correcting it, of course the debit side is okay. So we do not really have to yeah, adjust the debit side. We simply debit to remove the share capital and the premium. That's all. Now, let's see my answer okay, to the part two here. Six marks. Yes, I would like to write six points, but I've written more than six points. You can pick up any six points you want. I would say the first thing, quoting from the IFR specifically to this scenario, is that the equity instrument is just to be the residual interest that we use asset deducting all of its liabilities. It's like shares. We can share the remaining amount in the business. However, the financial liability is an obligation to pay cash. Or, yes, you can say that transfer cash or other financial asset, okay, uh, but uh, paying shares and, and so on to, to others, I don't really care. But uh, it's just to be an obligation. You have to do it. You have to do it, which means it will be a fixed amount, fixed dollars, okay, uh, that will be a financial liability. However, a compound instrument includes the element from financial liability and equity. Yes, this is my third point regarding the quote from the relevant IFIs. And also I would say that according to ICE number one presentation that if the departure results in more relevant financial information, yes, you can depart from the IFRS accounting treatment. But from my perspective, it's highly unlikely that students can spot this. So make sure that you focus on the first three points from the IFRS quota. Now, let's apply to the case. Firstly, although it is the preference share which is non-redeemable, it contains equity and liability element. I will have to tell the examiner, firstly, it's the cash dividend of 5% on the par value will be the liability element, and the participating dividend, about 7% of the ordinary share dividend, to be paid as the preference share dividend, will be like the equity element, because the amount will not be fixed each and every time. And therefore, I will need to measure the financial liability. Yes, you can say that it's like we are paying interest and we discount all of them. But you can also say that because it's the non-redeemable preference shares, it's highly likely that it carrying a value of the non-redeemable preference shares due to a fixed dividend will be a financial liability. So, what do I mean by that is that the fixed dividend into first year, second year, third year, let's say $10 each, and we need to discount them into today's value. Okay. Which means taking 10, divide this into, let's say, 1 plus 6% of the discount rate for power of 1, for power of 2, and for power of 3, and then plot them all together, including... Uh, we're not sure about how much money do we need to pay for uh, at the end because it's not redeemable and this is why we need to apply more years okay, of these cash flows but more specifically the ways that we can do in practice is to use the perpetuity approach for example 10 divide this into 6% uh, okay, I see values that we recognize today okay, as the financial liability 
So depending on how much money that you can get, with the residual value, classify that into reserve. So in other words, for the initial measurement, we should debit cash and to credit financial liability and the balancing figure goes into reserve. Now, my conclusion is that, yes, you will need to further disclose the characteristics of a compound instrument, including the nature of the transaction and the dividend policies, uh, dividend uh, details in there, uh, so to tell the shareholders about them. Now, very, very good question so far. Now, I'd like to stop the tape now, and I will look forward to seeing you in the next of our recording to go through the most difficult part, which means the ICE number for, uh, 7 statement of cash flows in much more details, and how to put all of these in the CBE uh, exam software. I will look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye. APC, accounting for your future.